You're now in the United Kingdom. I'm in both places. You're, you're in no man's land. I'm in no man's land. Yeah. I want to know why a person wakes up in the morning and then kills a person for fun. After seven months of debate, the House and Senate unanimously passed a bill requiring lawmakers to use their own money to settle accusations of sexual harassment or retaliation. The bill also allows Hill staffers to bypass a 90-day waiting period and file complaints immediately in a public system that would include the names of members being accused. Hungary's parliament passed a bill that allows companies to force workers into 400 hours of overtime each year and gives companies three years to pay them for it. Opposition lawmakers tried to block the vote and about 2,000 protesters gathered outside. But Prime Minister Viktor Orban's right-wing Fidesz party holds two-thirds of the seats. He says the law will help companies fill a labor shortage and help workers earn more. Russian operative Maria Butina signed a plea deal with federal prosecutors admitting to working under the direction of a Russian official to establish lines of communication between the Kremlin and politically influential Americans, including the NRA. Those crimes could have put her in prison for five years, but if she cooperates with prosecutors, she'll face six months or less. A list of the most common passwords used in 2018, culled from the more than 5 million leaked this year, just goes to show that no amount of security breaches will overpower humanity's laziness or lack of creativity. The Senate voted this afternoon to end American support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen passing a bill that would order the president to withdraw any troops involved in the offensive within 30 days. It's largely symbolic because the House approved a rule this week that forbids any debate on war powers for the remainder of the year. But there was one breakthrough today. You have reached an agreement. In Sweden, the Saudis and Houthi rebel leaders agreed to a ceasefire around the port city of Hodeidah the entry point for 80% of food and aid that Yemen is counting on to stave off outright famine. Forty-year-old Maki al Aslami runs the only health clinic in Aslam, one of the poorest districts in Yemen. At least one in six kids here is severely malnourished. Without her care, many of her patients would die in days. <laughs> Dr. Al Aslami's unit at the clinic opened last year specifically to treat malnutrition. <laughs> Since then, she's seen about 200 patients a day, but she doesn't have the supplies she needs to get every child's weight back to normal. Because Dr. Al Aslami is short on resources for treatment, she tries to focus on prevention. <laughs> Yeah. 
Not all of her patients can afford the taxi fare to her clinic. So instead, she goes to them, <laughs> driving 20 miles through wasted farmland. <laughs> The people living in a Mutayhara camp fled cities like Sa'ban Hudayda as the fighting intensified over the past year. Drastic water shortages mean that these families are forced to use whatever they can get. The doctor at Eslami is trying to make sure this well stays off limits. Jabra Hamzi fled with her family for the third time earlier this year. Dr. Al-Aslami has had to treat her youngest, Rahib, over and over again. Aid agencies are sending some food and other relief. But to Dr. Al-Aslami, the greater priority is enforcing the ceasefire in Hudayda the port that aid would pass through. A day after cheating political death, Theresa May went to Brussels to try to pull off an even bigger miracle, a Brexit deal that Parliament can actually pass. For all of the big egos and shouting in Westminster and Brussels... He couldn't care less about Brexit. The heart of the problem is a place that, right now, is peaceful and quiet. The river here beside us is the dividing line between uh, the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom. And the border is actually half of that river there. This is Pettigo, population 600. Crossing the border is so easy here, you might not even notice you're doing it. Face me. Face you? Yeah. And right. you're on the foot crossover. OK. You're in the United Kingdom. OK, now. so I'm now... You're in no man's land. I'm in no man's land. Yeah. Amazing. Should we take the cross? No bother. <laughs> but residents like Patrick Britton can remember a time when there was a hard border here, and it was a potent indicator of the conflict between Unionists and Republicans. The biggest thing that happened that time was the security checkpoints. You were stopped regularly on the road. 
your car, searched your purse and searched and, and things like that. Just general hassle that you didn't need going to your work. The border is 300 miles long and has 208 crossings. More than 20% of each country's trade is with the other, which means that about 30,000 people cross over every day, mostly without thinking about it. But after Brexit, the border will become the European Union's frontier with the UK. If there's no trade agreement, there would need to be new controls to check the products moving back and forth. That's an image that doesn't sit well with people who've lived through the troubles. Yes, that was a trying time back in the early 70s now, yeah. My premises here had been blown up between bombs and incendiary devices maybe six times. Your own premises? Yeah. Those memories must be still very vivid for you and for other people that live here. No, oh, yeah. No, it was a very trying time now back then. So the border is a very symbolic thing then? Nobody wants to see a hard border back again. You know, definitely not around here, not anywhere in Northern Ireland. There's a possibility it's going to bring back trouble again. Just nobody knows what the end result is going to be. So what do you want the politicians to do? Well, I'd like to see them get it sorted out uh, and uh, leave the country as it is. No hard border. Theresa May's Brexit deal has an insurance policy to avoid all of this. But it's also the reason why her deal is going nowhere. She says, if there's no trade deal, Northern Ireland will keep the same customs rules as the Irish Republic until it's all figured out. That would effectively make Northern Ireland different to the mainland and to Unionists, less British. They say that's a red line. It's something people died to prevent. And in the Irish Republic, people don't want the return of any border. Do you think the politicians currently negotiating Brexit get it? Do you know what I mean? I don't think they get what people have gone through here. No, they don't. No, that they, they haven't got a clue. They've created something in Ireland uh, that they don't understand themselves. Nobody wants to go back there, you know. It's a, a backward step, backward step. Historian Julia Scott has a new book out called The Common Wind. It shows how enslaved people in the Caribbean secretly communicated with each other to resist and sometimes even escape their captors. It's an untold aspect of slavery, and it's made The Common Wind academia's trendiest read. But the book isn't actually new. Scott wrote it as his PhD dissertation in 1986. The first place that I submitted it to returned it and said, it's a pretty nice dissertation, but we're not really interested in publishing it. We think it's too narrow and specialized. My view at the time was that I was going to return to it. I just never did. I just wasn't sure that it was quite good enough to be a book yet. People say this to me all the time. You're a perfectionist. When people use that term, it sounds like a compliment, but it's really kind of a critique. The idea of my being a perfectionist meant that I would never let go of this dissertation. Even now, I don't really necessarily believe that what is going to come out as the common wind is, like, perfect. While the manuscript sat unpublished, its legend grew, like a particularly hot academic mixtape. Photocopies and PDFs were passed around to readers, including historian Marcus Redeker. The common wind had an extraordinary underground life, even though, I should say, especially because it was unpublished. It was not altogether easy to get a hold of, but that became part of its mystique and part of its power. At the heart of Scott's book is the Haitian Revolution of the 1790s, when enslaved Africans successfully revolted against the French, ultimately making Haiti the first country to be founded by formerly enslaved people. What Scott found was that even though enslaved people in the Caribbean were oppressed and seemingly isolated, they often knew more about what was happening than their enslavers did. The ways in which word, news, information, rumors, half-truths traveled from place to place, and the role that people of African descent played in that process is really what it's about. There were a lot of little specks where people tried to establish for themselves a little bit more mobility and sometimes were able to grasp some freedom. So how did Scott finally make it into bookstores? 
In 2015, a Verso editor asked Redeker what he'd recommend publishing, and he said The Common Wind. It was, to my mind, perfectly appropriate that the reputation of The Common Wind was built by word of mouth, by conversation, by people spreading the news, which was a perfect parallel to the story Julia Scott was telling about how the word of the Haitian Revolution was actually spread. By word of mouth, by whispering on the lower decks of a ship, people talking about something that they considered to be urgently important. The reaction of historians in a great many fields, now that they know the book has been published, their reaction has been joy. Joy, I mean, people are delighted. They're just a little bit crooked at night. And this stupid light, man, keeps falling down. I really couldn't begin to count how many individual pieces of, of true crime-related memorabilia that are in my collection. Most of the artwork is from people convicted of heinous crimes. I have one of the bigger collections. That's me with James Monroe and Gregory Miley, uh, freeway killer. That's me with Charles Ng. His artwork is amazing. I mean, that's watercolor. That's done in a, in a prison cell. So yeah, no, I don't really draw a line and say this, oh no, you killed children, I can't collect your stuff. Or oh no, this guy killed women, I can't. Because if you do that, you won't be able to collect anything. That's me with Gary Hines, Christopher Wilkins, Michael Yawell. That's me with Charles Manson. I want to know why a person wakes up in the morning and then kills a person for fun. Where did that person go from here to here? I don't understand that. In that interest, I started you know, liking the artwork. Like some people like country music and some people like hip hop. I'm interested in crime. I visit with, you know, people who kill people. When I received my first communion, they asked, uh, they did this little book, like a workbook to fill out. And it asked, you know, there's people that need help throughout the world. Who would you like to help? And I said, prisoners. And I drew a picture of me passing a juice box into an inmate's cell. The first serial murder I ever wrote to was Richard Ramirez, and he wrote back. And I thought to myself, oh, this is easy. So I wrote Manson next. My collection does come from a, it comes from a, a bunch of different places. The most important part was sent to me by, by the inmates. And those are items that I've, you know, the cases that I took an interest in. I've also traveled to, you know, prison museums, uh, prison gift shops. Uh, there's some, some craft items here, like, like these three items were made uh, uh, at, at San Quentin. I bought them at the gift shop. We're on a website called murderauction.com. And that website's like an eBay, of, of anything, you know, crime related. This Charles Manson unmailed postcard that's got a $55 bid on it. No matter how heinous or despicable his case and his crimes are, people are always gonna want their stuff. There's 26 people on online right now on the site. We have 190 members, there's uh, 833 auctions. I'm not getting items from inmates, putting them for sale online, based on the horrific nature of their crimes and then paying them. People collect art. That's all there is to it. Biggest misconception is inmates are getting big amounts of money from this. It's, 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 you know, it's chump change. There's three uh, urns in here. The one on top here is uh, my grandmother, Dorothea Puente. People have asked to buy portions and that's really not what, uh, it's not what it's about for me. Why would somebody want to buy your grandmother's remains? She was a convicted multiple murderer. Get away, please. I mean, they found seven bodies in her yard and attributed her to two additional disappearances, so nine victims in total. What's the strange is she was uh, only convicted on three. And it doesn't make sense. If you find seven bodies in a yard, You'd think you'd get convictions on all seven. People are into this. From that interest in crime, all of this came from it.
That's some shit you fall off a table to. This is that kind of vibe. Gothic kids and underneath the bridge, like two like white girl twins connected by the hair. Like, we appreciate power. Like that kind of production is like Elon Musk on the beat. It's got a Tesla type of energy. He made the torch, right? Do you guys have one of those here? That's what it feels like, blowtorch music. Scissor Sisters, perhaps? Wolfpack. Maybe. It was? Yeah. Damn, those are the homies. Come on, Wolf. Just too bright and happy. I did like the guitar riff, but I don't know, man. The beat was sick. I thought it was about to be some crazy spitting. I just felt like they, we knew the whole song within the first, like, 10 seconds. I guess it is catchy. I know the whole song. It's XXX. Really? Yeah. No way. Who knows if this was even like a song he would want to put out, you know? Like, what if it was like just like supposed to be a demo that he was not trying to put out? I'm gonna be pissed like when I'm gone and people just put out my voice notes and my demos and stuff. I'm gonna come back to haunt everyone. You're showing your horns. They trying to replace my halo with thorns. You so basic with your vape stick. Let's go ape shit in the matrix. Arrest the president. Cube. You know, I'm always gonna love Cube, man. What do you say? Creep walk to. Bow, 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 bow. So, like the drums, the collapse, epic sound. Some could argue it's, it might be a little dated, I guess, but I think it's probably really refreshing in today's landscape where all the beats sound like little trap beats. Cube's always doing political stuff. I like that he's out making new music and talking shit about the president. I'm all for it. <laughs> Pin drop, everyone's waiting for the marshal to arrive. If you guys unify, then this won't be so important because you're not at war. If the US ensure our security yeah. and withdraw the hostile anti DPRK policy. Yeah. Yes. We talked about friendship and bilateral relations. So it's very interesting the messaging that was sent here tonight in Pyongyang. 